The biggest mistake anyone can make when writing Superman is writing him as an alien or a god. Yes, Kal-El was born on Krypton. Yes, he has incredible power. But Clark Kent was raised in Smallville, Kansas. As any other boy, his family raised him to do good unto others and to use his gifts for the good of humanity. He was taught empathy, kindness. Sure, he can drag planets behind him and fly light years in space in moments, but at the end of the day, Superman is a man with a kind heart. The best Superman stories focus on the Man of Steel's humanity, not his power. The man over the steel. You're probably wondering, what does any of this have to do with hell? When writing a demon into a story, a writer can choose one of many creative options. Demons are supposed to be evil, so they can be harbingers of doom, forces of destruction, or masters of temptation. But what about demons who choose to redeem themselves? Is redemption possible, even for personifications of sin? The redemptive monster is a trope that's existed since the beginning of literature, since Enkidu chose against his violent nature to side with Gilgamesh. But to take a personification of evil and make them good, well that's wholly different. How do stories manage to balance out good and evil in narratives? Is there an easy or complicated way to do it? And do redemptive demons end up creating a more powerful narrative or an inconsistent one? This video essay is a companion piece to my previous video essay on the all evil races in media. I recommend you check that out, or at least the segment on demons, before we proceed here. In stories like Hellboy or Spawn, demonic heroes are forced to overcome their evil natures in order to defend humanity. But does that make demons kind of inconsistent? In effect, no. Because while demons may be always chaotically evil in some stories, they are not in all stories. Hellboy's assortment of monsters and Spawn's Hellspawn are neither always good or always evil. While both Spawn and Hellboy function as Antichrist figures in their own way, neither are as overt as, say, the Omen's Demon. Spawn, obviously, was not born a demon. He was born a man. Al Simmons is a mercenary who, upon dying, makes a deal with Malbolgia. In exchange for leading Hell's forces as a Hellspawn, Al can see his beloved wife Wanda again. And things go bad for Al, but he figures, well, if Hell didn't give me what I want, I'm just going to burn Hell to the ground. Spawn's morality is a little more black and gray, but Hellboy's morality, it's more ambiguous and more ambitious. Hellboy is more of a true Antichrist than Spawn. Count to what you may think, Hellboy is actually human. Well, part human, on his mother's side. His mother was a witch who tried to repent on her deathbed. In retaliation, her patron, the archdemon Azael, dragged her off to Hell and turned her newly born child, who, let's just say, came out through a demonic C-section and just leave the details alone there, into a key to summon the eldritch Agdru Jihad and summon the forces of Hell to Earth. Unfortunately for Hell, Hellboy was summoned by Rasputin in World War II. Apparently, Rasputin chose to work for Hitler after those Russians did something about this outrageous man. However, much like Superman with the Kents, Hellboy fell into the care of Professor Trevor Brudelholm, who raised him as a Catholic and as a member of the Bureau for Paranormal Research and Defense, the BPRD. There, he was treated not as a freak, but as a normal person. Despite Hellboy being destined to bring about destruction, he instead developed a love of pancakes and cats, and a talent at fighting evil. Hellboy is destined to bring about destruction, but he still chooses to fight that destiny at every turn. To this end, he opposes any force that causes destruction, be it Hell, the Nazis, the Baba Yaga, or even at some point, the BRPD itself. Despite Hellboy being created for purpose, he is a product of nurture more than nature, even as nature's demands take their toll. Of course, not all demons in media are universally evil. There are several examples, especially in Japanese media, where demons are more of a neutral chaotic force. Yu Yu Hakusho subverts expectations regarding demons multiple times, 
At first, Yusuke is tasked as a spirit detective with defeating dangerous apparitions and monsters, but soon encounters many morally ambiguous adversaries. Some, like Kurama and Hiei, become companions. Others, like many demons fought in the Dark Tournament, become enemies to rivals. Yusuke's less rigid moral compass is what separates him from Sensui, his spirit detective predecessor, who saw humanity as unambiguously good and demon kind as unambiguously evil. That is until his moral compass was tested. Then he ultimately inverted his morality entirely, seeking to destroy the evil humanity using demon kind. It also turns out that Yusuke himself is part demon, on his mother's side, a distant relative there. He soon finds himself divided between the human world and the demon world, trying to find his place therein. In the manga we later learn that our perspective of demon world in general has been completely manipulated by spirit world in order to justify their authority over their domain. The resolution between mankind and demon kind ultimately is one of peace. It's also telling that the most evil character in the whole series is the elder Taguro brother, a character who started off as a human, but chose to become a demon in order to remain immortal and all-powerful. When he ultimately is defeated, far later than anyone expected in the series, his fate is suitably terrible, and the one who defeats him is Kurama, a demon who has chosen to become and remain a human. Of course, there is the added question, what about monsters that do not understand right or wrong as we understand them? Can they develop a moral center? The angels start off as these destructive figures, they're kaiju essentially. By all accounts, they're fairly simple on the surface with abstract cool designs. That is, until something happens halfway through the series. The angels start to probe our characters' minds. They start to, one by one, interrogate the Ava pilots who pilot them. They suck them into a realm and put them into a weird phantom train. They organically graft themselves to a pilot's cockpit. They forcibly invade a young girl's mind. All this keeps escalating until we meet Kaoru, an angel who by all accounts is the only person capable of showing Shinji empathy in a time when he needs it most. What we thought were these fairly generic monsters of the week are actually a collection of entities, all of which, by virtue of existing, cause destruction, both in the physical sense and in the minds of our characters. There's something profoundly sad about that. All of these examples enrich their respective stories by adding complexity and nuance to what might otherwise be dismissed as forces of evil or chaos. Evil should always be a choice, something a character chooses to do for petty or self-righteous reasons, or even just for the sake of doing something awful. What these redemptive characters all prove is that, just like someone can choose to be bad, they can also choose to do good, even if that goodness is counter to their natures or, at worst, self-destructive. And this in turn adds a layer of nuance to the rest of their evil society or race from which they hail. All of them can choose to do good, but they simply don't. In this sense, we return again to Clark Kent. In the newest iteration of Superman, My Adventures with Superman, we learn that the Kryptonians are conquerors who, years prior to the series' start, actually tried to lay siege to Earth. The antagonists of the story are trying to hunt Superman because they see him as just another part of this evil society. But when Clark is confronted with the actions of the other Kryptonians, he just starts crying. Is he part of this greater invading force? Is he somehow tainted for the sins of the people he never interacted with? He has to struggle with the knowledge that his people, the people he feels offer some answers about his identity, want to destroy everything he holds dear. And unlike in many other Superman stories, the first season of My Adventures with Superman doesn't end with Clark learning about his past. There's a lot that remains unanswered, but the family and friends who have taken him in are ultimately more important to Clark than his people that he shares his blood with. And I think there's something profound about that. <laughs>